Should be. All right, boss. Everything's okay. Okay, so um, I think we're going to just allow people to uh, filter in as they come. Um, I'm just going to announce an upcoming event and then hand it over to Lisa. Um, on November 14th uh, at the new school in uh, in uh, on the sixth floor of Eugene Lang. Uh, we're going to be holding an event on radical interpretations of the present crisis. Um, we've got some really great speakers for that. Uh, we've got David Harvey from CUNY. We've got Lauren Goldner, uh, editor of uh, Insurgent Notes. We've got Andrew Kleiman from uh, Pace University. And Paul Maddock of the uh, Brooklyn Rail. And, I mean, roughly, I mean, the, the concept is that, you know, <coughs> How is it that we have such sophisticated interpretations of the world without any pro re reasonable prospect of uh, changing it? How, how intelligible even is the world you know, without our being able to intervene in it? Um, so yeah, if, if you're free uh, in the next month, um, it should be a really great event. So yeah, stay tuned. Uh, more will be appearing about it online. So Lisa? Thank you. Um, I'm Lisa Montanarelli from the Platypus Affiliated Society. This panel is hosted by um, our, our student organization established in December 2006. We have chapters in a number of cities including New York, Chicago, Boston, London, Halifax, Toronto. We organize reading groups, public fora, research and journalism focused on problems and tasks inherited from the old left of the 1920s and 30s the new left of the 1960s and 70s, and the post-political left of the 1980s and 90s uh, for the possibilities of emancipatory politics today. Since 2011, we've sponsored a series of panels and roundtables on Occupy in Boston, Chicago, Halifax, London, as well as New York City. You can watch recordings of all our Occupy-related events on our website. We also invite everyone to take home issues of our monthly publication, The Platypus Review, and to join us for weekly coffee breaks and a reading group. Here in New York City, we have branches at NYU, The New School, and Stony Brook. Our NYU chapter coffee breaks at uh, 6 p.m. are on Tuesday, uh, on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Our New School coffee breaks at 5.30 on Thursdays, and we also have a reading group at The New School from two to five every Sunday. For the locations, please see our flyers or website at um, newyork.platypus1917.org. So without further ado, I'll go into a few brief remarks and then the questions for our panelists. Uh, the year 2011 witnessed popular uprisings erupting on almost every continent. In the first months, protests broke out in North Africa and the Middle East. By summer, they spread to Latin America, Asia, Europe, and even Sub-Saharan Africa. And in September of last year, this wave of protests struck the US in the form of Occupy Wall Street, which quickly provoked thousands of sympathetic occupations around the nation and globe, from Occupy o Oakland to Occupy Des Moines, Des Moines to Occupy Paris. Um, Occupy tapped into popular rage to gather disparate ideologies under one tent. Some people called for class war, others for economic reforms, and still others for transformations beyond the bounds of economic conditions. These perspectives pointed to radically different directions for this movement, yet slogans like we are the 99% tended to suppress differences in favor of unity. We'd like to ask our panelists to consider what ideological tensions remain unresolved and keep reemerging. What might be the meaning of the present moment? What needs to be clarified? It also seems clear that Occupy has not yet achieved what it imagined possible in October of 2011. So why has Occupy, and in fact, why have all the movements of 2011, the so-called Arab Spring, the European Summer, and the American fall, as well as more localized phenomena like the Quebec student strike, accomplished so much less than they expected. And what have you learned from this experience? What have we all learned from this experience? And finally, I'd like us to look at the present moment in light of possibilities left over from the past, the tasks we've inherited that may, we may have yet to fulfill. If uh, our um, Assumption here is if we don't think about our mistakes and missed opportunities, we, mit we risk repeating them without even knowing it. So how can we learn from the past so that we don't squander opportunities in the present moment? How can we maximize these opportunities? Um, 
So without further ado, I'd like to get to the first question. And you can answer it, um, you know, you don't have to answer every question, but just um, let me know which ones you would like to answer. Um, I'll read the first one and then see which panelist would like to take that. What has changed between September 17th, when the moment began, May Day of the present year, and the one year anniversary of S17, as far as these are significant dates in the history of the movement? What was different, or what has changed between working groups, individuals, and the constituency of the movement as a whole? Would you? Well, I think that I think that we can learn a lot by looking at what happened outside the movement during this time um, as a reflection of what happened in it. Um, last fall, you had you had um, Troy Davis. I think that incited a lot of rage around the country. You had um, the threat of SOPA and PIPA a month later. You had. Um, Julian Assange and Bradley Manning coming to surface again, and they kind of acted as torch holders for, um, yeah, for what was happening. And um, so I think that Occupy was really able during those first few months to direct the forces around it in a way that made it very productive and maybe very influential. But um, it was able to claim this victory by occupying the attention of the mainstream media on a really national scale. But it started to fail when this strategy became a means to its survival. So I think that the difference between all of those dates really lies in um, Occupy's ability or inability to create this new narrative. And also, um, when these practices fail to produce uh, Failed to produce real victories or victories that were as real as like handcuffs and concrete, then um, then getting arrested and taken in the streets became a lot more, a lot less attractive. And um, yeah, and I think there was, I think morale really suffered um, throughout last year, and also the police's ability to adapt to um, the movements of a large crowd and really neutralize the political energy that was there from the very beginning. Okay, would anyone like to, else like to answer the first question? Talk into the mic a bit. Okay. For everyone. Yes. Um, okay, Fritz? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, before Occupy, uh, New York and the American General had a very vibrant civil society uh, to relate this to Tahrir Square uh, in Egypt and elsewhere in the Arab world. Our dictatorships made it so that the only civil society that was possible were uh, <coughs> organized around mosques, uh, which is why the big days of action were always on Fridays. Um, so in Arab Spring, it more took on this dimension of what could we do that we could not do before? And they occupied the squares and battled the police for it. Um, and as a result, uh, their government is very similar in many ways, but they now have possibilities for thriving civil society in Egypt. Um, here, there were a lot of things that we could do. Uh, we did have a thriving civil society. We even could stay in Zakati. We were allowed to stay in Zakati for as long as uh, the company that owned it allowed us to. And when they said no more, then we were uh, violently thrown out of Zakati. So I think right now what is obviously different is that there's no more occupation. And I don't really see much as having changed before and after because we still have thriving civil society here and we're allowed to meet in public like we're doing right now. Um, one difference between now and while it was happening though is that at the time having everybody there put forward this idea that we could all come together and get past our differences and actually work together to create a different world that would be nice to live in. 
Um, however, I would like to say that what I saw is if I, it seemed that this square, uh, people were less working together and more working side by side. Uh, and so the fact that they were next to each other gave off uh, the illusion that people were actually working together, but uh, the General Assembly was not a particularly effective thing. It was mostly the working groups who were doing all of the stuff, and they were pretty uh, not coordinated with one another. Would anyone else like to add anything in response to this first question? Um, yeah. Um, does this work here? Okay. Um, I don't like the fact that we are trying to define our current moment as a moment of defeat. I think that if we're going to move forward from this moment in a positive direction, defining it in such a negative light from the get-go isn't going to be productive. And I think I go back in my head to August of 2011 during the planning of Occupy Wall Street up to September 17th, and I think about where we were then, and I think about the 30 years that came before that, what Occupy calls uh, the 80s and 90s. And I think that in one year, I, I don't remember the term, uh, in one year, I think more was achieved in that, in, than in those past 20 years. Um, and I remember that before that time, I'm so glad that in the introduction we talked about the Arab Spring and Spain, and I don't remember what else was mentioned, but you know the context, the global context of things, um, because that was very much on people's minds. I remember before Occupy, there was a thing um, about Occup uh, you know, going down to Wall Street and doing an action, and there were all these quotes from around the world saying like, "Where is New York, Spain? You know, where is New York, Egypt?" Um, and I think it's easy. I think people are prone, not because you know it has something to do with something called human nature. Uh, but just because of our cultural context to think to not think back that far vividly but I think if you do you realize um, how much was accomplished by the Occupy movement okay yes please does this work okay um, a couple things I want to say first off off the bat that um, it's my understanding that what I think a lot of us thought was possible in the summer and fall of 2011, we like far exceeded. And, um, <clears throat> and I, I think beyond that, gr growing up in the movement before Occupy, we were kind of always in the shadow of Seattle in the 1999. And with this kind of, kind of understanding that like the generation of organizers before us had all been in Seattle and that had been this moment that had kind of impacted their soul like from that point on. Um, and. I think that one thing that Occupy has offered is that in, in a certain way it's kind of trained or inspired this generation of organizers, I think many of whom will be around for a long time, and that everything that they do is going to have the imprint of Zuccotti Park on, in it, or like the spirit of Occupy in it, um, and, and I, I don't think that can be understated, I think that's like a very important thing that's come out of this. Um, but one other thing about what's, what's changed since over the past year is that um, and initially, like with the 99% slogan and all that, Occupy was this kind of like ambiguous coalition of like many different social forces. And I, I think in certain ways we're seeing the breakdown of that. Um, and I, I, I think the most important or like evident aspect of that is, do people know about the grand jury resistors in Seattle right now? Um, so not, not so much. So, so right now um, in Seattle, the FBI is going to be in the grand jury to investigate anarchist involvement with the Occupy movement. Um, it's ostensibly in relation to some like kind of petty vandalism that happened on May Day in Seattle, but it was actually convened several months before May Day, um, and they've essentially been going around the Northwest, Olympia and Portland in particular, kicking in people's doors at four in the morning, arresting them, subpoenaing them, and then put in a situation where at a grand jury you either testify um, with information about your friends is going to result in putting them in prison, or you don't, and then you get put in prison in this case for up to a year and a half. So there's three people that are right now being held, at least two of them are in solitary confinement, um, potentially up to like March of 2014, simply for their political beliefs. Like in, in the search warrants, it listed like having black clothing, anarchist literature, things of that nature. And 
it's really I mean, striking to me that all of these kind of like institutional aspects of the left and um, kind of liberal groups that had spent the past year showing how down they were with Occupy Wall Street and kind of like, I, I think have kind of like profited a lot from the momentum it built, like particularly major unions and nonprofit groups, but also like Ben and Jerry's and Chris Hedges and whatever. I, I, I think it's really telling that not a single one of them has made a statement condemning this when, you know, j just like on May Day, all of them marched in the street with us and were, you know, so enthusiastic about everything we were doing. And like, where are they now that we're getting our doors kicked down at four in the morning? Uh, I usually try and talk without a microphone because I think I get a little weirded out by the microphone. So if that's if that's all right, with for, for the I'll recording, project well. Um, uh, for the recording, uh, just oh, for the recording. Okay, got it. <laughs> um, so I do really resonate with everything that's been said before this, and I agree and disagree with um, some of the things that were said. Um, like Dave, I take myself back to August of 2011 and the meetings in preparation um, for the occupation of Wall Street and what I thought that was, um, I, I immediately was reflecting on the call to action from Adbusters and the riots uh, in London. I had really preconceived notions of what I thought it was, um, and that had to do a lot with the personal constructs that I had built up for myself as a student living in New York, um, attending an institution, but still having student debt, and not feeling like this was, I guess I, everyone has referenced this idea of the moment, and not and myself not really understanding what that was. And for me, all that was really shattered on September 17th when I came to the park and I didn't leave. Um, I think what's interesting to note about September 17th, May Day, and September 17th of this year are kind of um, structural differences. Um, it was mentioned in the question, the kind of structural components like the working groups and individuals and how those things kind of undulated and changed between being exclusive and inclusive. And um, the truth is that there's been a world of difference. I mean, Occupy, as it, as it stood in New York City in the park last year, was a small thing. Um, until the media blew it up, it was less than 300 people per night, and most of them were not from the city, to be honest. I felt like for a long time I was one of the only New Yorkers that stayed in the park. There were maybe like 10 to 20 others. Um, and then once the, the mainstream media blackout had ended, there was this, like, um, this crazy resonance like all, all throughout the country and actually all throughout the world, but I think that what's changed is that, um, I guess it is, it is kind of an awakening of young organizers that are really trying to figure out their grounding, trying to learn from existing organizers, and I do really um, agree with what you just said. I, I know the feeling of like having this like, I wasn't there, I couldn't go to the, I was too young to go to like prior demonstrations in Seattle, or any, anything like that. I was like a middle schooler. So it's, it was really not something that I could plug into. It was not something conceptually that I understood. And here, for the first time, was this forum, this open space where you could really get your hands in on something. You could say something. You could make something. Um, I think between uh, then and now, things have become much more conceptual um, as far as um, demands and kind of things that we're aiming towards. I think everything has become more conceptual, and I think that that's something that's going to be highlighted in some of the upcoming questions. But um, I, I agree with Dave, and I think that there's more to look forward to, not necessarily under the Occupy brand. OK, great. Thanks, everyone. I'm glad that you, um, you brought up Seattle, um, 1999, because our next question is, would you character characterize Occupy and its offshoots as anti-capitalist? Should they be? If so, what is the nature of these anti-capitalist politics? In which way do Occupy and its sequelae affirm or reject the political ideas of anti-capitalist movements before that? Um, just indicate if you'd like to answer that, please. Okay. Um, Occupy wasn't anti-anything. And there was a lot of effort on the part of the movement to not um, take a negative stance towards anything. Um, and I don't think that the movement as a whole uh, was able to or even desired to articulate itself in those terms, though many individuals within it did. Um, but for a long time, you know, the encampment's survival did depend largely on monetary donations. And um, so, but at the same time, Occupy 
Occupy recognized the injustices created by a capitalist class society, and at its best moments, um, I think really did to, I, yeah, I think that Occupy really did try and use the present condition as a means to justice, including money. And I think this was wise in that it avoided the kind of, um, it avoided the pitfall of um, like of identifying itself as anti-capitalist or any other or any other kind of um, loaded political identity that would have given the mainstream media um, a lot to work with in terms of how the movement was seen. But um, at the same time, having this kind of like radical pluralist stance creates its own problems, and by not taking a position. Um, by, yeah, by not specifically taking an anti-capitalist position, I think there's a danger, especially especially in um, the coming years, that um, this attempt to work with capitalism is going to turn into this kind of entrepreneurial solution to the growth crisis of capitalism, while still affirming um, the systems of oppression. Thank you, Victoria. Would someone else like to respond as well? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think if you look at Occupy Wall Street, we can just look at the name Occupy Wall Street and its target and what it was doing and other things sort of fit under that umbrella. Um, it definitely looked different and sounded different than maybe movements before it that called itself anti-capitalist. But I think it was definitely against financial capitalism and corporate capitalism. I think at least there was that that in the air, while it was, maybe it was more plural and open to people who didn't consider themselves those things. I think just by it being Occupy Wall Street, it was against financial capitalism. Um, and uh, whether that's against capitalism as an ideal or an idea, um, I think it's a different question. If you read Marx, then he sort of believes that capitalism left to its own devices will become the current phase of capitalism we have now. Firms will get larger and larger and things will become more financialized. Um, so does, uh, does that make it anti-capitalist? I think that's, an, that's, that's, that's like a sort of a different question, um, but uh, I think it, it was able to grasp onto the part of the populace that always has this anti-capitalist zeitgeist, but doesn't really put it in those terms in a, in a really large way, especially in the way that it brought class back into the conscious of, of people in this country. And, and so much as it wasn't in people around the world, maybe it put it back into their minds as well. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Um, Anyone else responding to question number two about um, the anti-capitalism, if, if there is, if, if Occupy could be characterized as anti-capitalist in its relation to previous anti-capitalist movements? Chris. Okay, thank you. Um, so I agree with Dave. Uh, I think that Occupy Wall Street was pretty blatantly uh, anti-financial bourgeoisie, uh, which is kind of the main group in charge of our country right now. And I think it was a coalition of a bunch of different groups that are against this, like uh, the anarchists, socialist communists, uh, progressive liberals, as well as Ron Paul liberals. Um, and I think that uh, the normal progressive liberal, very into unions and a sane capitalism, uh, Ron Paul kind of into an insane capitalism, um, socialist and communist kind of usually into state capitalism. Um, I thought that actually uh, the anarchists were the group who more than anybody were actually truly uh, anti-capitalist in their ideas. Um, but I think it's important to recognize that capitalism is not the only form of oppression, nor do I think it takes on, you know, some sort of uh, special nature that trumps all other forms of oppression. I think that 
racism, sexism, uh, oppression of children, students, first, third world relations are just as important as capitalism and existed long before capitalism. Um, so I would say that what I saw of the anarchists and how they uh, organized during Occupy Wall Street, I thought um, it was not only <coughs> oppressive in its own right, uh, but I thought it was generally so inefficient that it kind of made capitalism and our modern society look pretty good and effective. Yeah, that's all I have to say. Okay, would, um, would you like to respond to the question? Uh, yeah. Um, again, I, being too young to have really um, been involved in like anti-capitalism movements in the past, I have only been able to kind of vicariously live through them via people that I now know and have been able to talk to about their experiences or video or theory that's come out of it. Um, and so in some ways that's kind of a detached way of approaching it, but um, I think, I mean the people that, I've, that I met in, in um, August of last year um, largely did consider themselves anarchists and anti-capitalists, um, whether they brought that to the table when they were organizing and when they were trying to get outreach and when people were coming in from all parts of the country um, was not really at the forefront of that discussion. And so in that sense, I think that there were pretty heavy anti-capitalist undertones to what we were doing in the park um, to begin with when we were really just marching on Wall Street twice a day, having meetings in between and um, kind of just doing outreach from there as opposed to what I understand kind of happened in Seattle, which was not initially anti-capitalist, but more kind of reformist, which became anti-capitalist as the movement grew. Um, so in some ways, I think that it's kind of um, an opposite trajectory, where what might have started out more um, militantly anti-capitalist became a much broader kind of question of like um, broadest common denominator, but what can we agree to kind of come together on at this table, at this place, right now, in this moment? Um, which was many things for many different people, and that's how that's how the occupation of Zuccotti Park came to stop marching on Wall Street and start addressing all of these other problems, which is, um, in this case, kind of a for better or for worse situation. I, I would have liked to continue marching, maybe not become so distracted in certain other aspects of maybe maintaining the park, but um, what happened is what happened, and, if, and since that's the way that it happened, I think it's really interesting to know like the development of these groups, how they came to associate with one another, and um, my experience being in any of those groups was not that they were working next to each other, but was that they were working with each other um, very closely, uh, and that the difference was that you had this inner working of a community located in a, like, a space-based place, and then you had kind of this peripherally uh, present audience that would attend things like the General Assembly or different sorts of actions. And so all of a sudden you had these kind of separate but the same entities. So there were just a lot of different things at play, but I, um, I, to this day I think words like anarchist and words like anti-capitalist have this kind of um, pariah-esque thing when you say them out loud, um, so much so that I have trouble identifying myself as an anarchist, um, especially when I'm like within like certain institutions of people, um, just because I don't think that if you, if you preface who you are by saying that, you kind of lose something. So it's I, I think it's, um, a, in terms of names, I don't know, I think it's a kind of a more complicated question of like self-identification versus like principle. Okay, thanks. Do we want to, um, did you have anything to say about that, this particular question, or would you rather move on to the next one? Um, yeah, real quick. Okay, great. Um, so, I, I think in the past several decades in the United States, there hasn't really been a, a large movement that's been explicitly anti-capitalist. I think there's largely been this dynamic, both in the alter globalization movement and in some other more recent movements like the immigrant movement and the anti-war movement of kind of a nucleus of people that are anti-capitalist within a much broader movement that e even even the ultra globalization movement at no point was dominantly anti-capitalist. It maybe was dominantly anti-neoliberal, but I, I think many of the factions that made up that were kind of like vague on where it, 
where they stood on the kind of like very like stru structural issues. Um, and, but I, I think one thing that's interesting about Occupy Wall Street is that the, the methods in which, like the ways in which it's organized itself are these things that's inherited from this long-standing anarchist project of prefigurative politics. Um, and so it kind of presents itself as this contradiction of like maybe subjectively not being explicitly anti-capitalist, but then organizing itself in a way that was in these methods that were built and intended to be experimenting with how we build structures and ways of life that go beyond capitalism. So I, I'm not sure if it's an either or thing. I think in some kind of like almost materialist ways, it was experimenting intentionally with like ways of being beyond capitalism, but I, I'm not, I, I think it'd be incorrect to say that everyone that was involved with those experiments intended that to be what it was. Um, I, I guess that's my answer. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Uh, so we'll, we'll go on to the next question. What kinds of social transformation has Occupy brought about? Where has it triumphed and where has it fallen short? Additionally, why has Occupy failed to achieve what it imagined possible in October 2011, um, if, if you feel that that's the case? And also, what have you learned from the experience of um, either fulfilled or non-fulfilled expectations or, or simply changed expectations and goals? What have you learned from, from this? Um, I think I can segue from that last question. Um, I think one of the one of the actions like early on in the movement that did I think have a lot of political gravity was when there was the attempt of maybe about a dozen people to close their bank accounts. Um, and this was during um, this was like during larger marches, but the reaction of like twelve people closing their city bank accounts was met with um, it was taken very seriously. And while there was um, like a move your money campaign floating around, I think that um, you know Occupy Wall Street did a lot um, in those early weeks to recognize the financial crisis of 2008 as a crime that somebody was blamed, that somebody should be blamed for, as opposed to just blaming oh you know the market failed. Um, and I think if there had been a lot more effort and a lot more intensity to take responsibility to, for um, where, what bank you use, or if there had been a lot more behind um, supporting, uh, supporting uh, smaller banks or credit unions, then there might have been, um, there might have been some kind of social transformation. But there was a lot of, um, you know, Social transformation happens on, on a very small level, and I think that there was a huge separation in Occupy between ideology and practice. For example, you know, we may be protesting large corporations, but we're still getting coffee every morning from McDonald's. Like, we're st we still use the Bank of America ATM. Um, and so I think a lot of it was just focus and intensity towards one issue that everybody, that perhaps everybody um, shared or could have gotten behind. Fritz, do you want to say something? Um, so, uh, on the subject of has it created social change, fundamental social change, I think if you just go down the list, talk about uh, different modes of repression, uh, working class, women, uh, race, third world, children, students, I think. Obviously, all of these uh, antagonisms in our society still exist a year later. Um, I think that what Occupy Wall Street uh, did that was triumphant was keeping alive this idea that people can all get together and go out in the hundreds and thousands and millions and just totally take shit over. I mean, this is like a pretty uh, a 
amazing idea dating back to Russian and French revolutions. Uh, even, you know, Jesus led a people's movement on Jerusalem to protest the European occupation. Uh, so it's like a very, very long tradition that has been kept alive partly by Occupy Wall Street, and I'm very glad that it happened. Um, where it failed, um, I think that it was not able to organize society in alternative ways. I know whenever I was at a meeting, I was dragging on and people would just be like, well, you know, it's a messy process, and it's heart-wrenching, and it can be boring. And the other day, I, uh, I'm taking part in Brooklyn's, uh, it's happening all over the city this year, uh, but there's a participatory budgeting thing. This is a movement that started in Porto Alegre in Brazil uh, 20 years ago, and over a thousand cities in the world are doing it right now, where people get together, put forward ideas of what to do with the public's money, and then they vote, one person, one vote, majority wins on what they're gonna do. And I went to this meeting, and it was not messy. It was like really efficient, it was really quick, it was really fun, it was not boring. Just went, got stuff done in about an hour and a half. And then, that was it. Um, and I also want to say one more thing, is that uh, this idea that Occupy has gotten so much done. I mean, we do have a vibrant civil society. And I think that this urban revolution puts forth the idea that civil society can take over instead of these little cliques that usually use traditional warfare methods um, to divide people. And we already have a vibrant civil society. There are groups that combat domestic violence every single day. Uh, through legal means. There is just a documentary on PBS about the interrupters in Chicago who go and combat gang violence. It's just former gang members. They just keep their ears to the streets. And whenever they hear someone going down, they just get in between it and don't let it happen. I mean, we have unions. We have a lot of stuff. And people are doing a whole lot. And part of the reason we have all the things we have are these people are doing these things. So. I don't really think that like in the 90s nothing happened and then Occupy Wall Street happened and now everything's happening. Actually like I think that we have the uh, rudimentary parts of a very different society and we just need to get those groups in control instead of the state. Just uh, Dave, did you? Oh. Um. Yeah, uh, what new possibilities have opened up and what doesn't seem. Um, I think that it's an, it's an I, I don't, I, I again don't like that we're formulating it as if Occupy is something that happened and now we're in a moment that isn't Occupy. Um, I think that's self-defeating. Um, I think that when people talk about Occupy, you know, we don't really talk about what, you know, we were, I remember in that summer we were talking about how we were going into one of the most militarized areas in the world, you know, and there was a brutal state repression that helped break it up. I mean, I guess part of that is that you're looking at it, well, what techni and techniques do we do, you know, because that should be maybe expected or part of it. But um, I think that should always be kept in mind that like the failures of Occupy aren't necessarily a failure of the horizontal process or prefigurative anarchism or something. Um, they're just parts of the nature of this kind of struggle uh, where we are. Um, I think right now, some of the things that I'm very happy about that have come out of Occupy partly uh, is the Walmart strikes that are happening around the country. Um, I think strike debt is amazing. I think these two things together um, have a lot of potential. Um, I think the kind of coming back of a labor movement and reinterpreting the labor movement that my group's partly doing, but other groups are partly doing, it's happening around the country, along with the idea of striking debt um, and maybe newer ideas than organized labor, maybe all these other ideas that are coming out of Occupy. Um, 
where it falls short, I think you could list any kind of thing that it hasn't done and then say that's where it falls short. Um, so I can only look at what it's done and not bring in every other form of, you know, uh, a problem that exists in the world and say, well, Occupy hasn't done this, you know, I, I don't have five dollars, you know. Um, so I think that's, that's another thing. Um, I think it was possible to go into the movement and go into one corner of it and decide this is what the movement was, this is what the process was, and get very disillusioned, think you found, you know, these are the people who are in charge, and then you can go back the next day and go into another corner, and you could get that exact same impression because of the kind of movement it was. Um, so I think those are two of the concrete examples. Sotheby's is a labor struggle. That was one in New York. A lot of that energy came out of Occupy. Um, in general, labor is winning now because of Occupy. And that's just the corner that I know about because I'm directly involved in it. Um, so. Um, I think I'll speak first, I guess, to um, personal transformations before I speak to the larger social transformations that I um, experienced or witnessed. Um, I'll say that I did live in the park with the exception of two days. One was after I was arrested and one was um, I don't even remember what it was, I just know there was another day that I wasn't there. Um, and being within it, and also being a part of the larger global movement, I worked um, a lot with the streaming group Global Revolution, and being kind of acutely aware of what was really going on, not just in the park, but domestically and then internationally. Um, I felt like I had a pretty good grip on things. Uh, little did I know how kind of out of touch I was until um, the morning after the rave, uh, and I had left the park because I wasn't arrested, but I was kind of walking aimlessly and I hadn't yet withdrawn from school. And I was like, "This is it's already November. I think like this is it's kind of crazy." So I walked, I walked to school, and it was like 7 a.m. I waited until um, my administration kind of opened up, and I was able to like talk to them. And then I remember having to meet someone in Midtown, um, and this was probably the first time. I the two, two and a half months that I had like gone past 14th Street, and it was this crazy kind of culture shock moment where it's like the rest of the city is um, proceeding with their day as normal. They don't know or care precisely as to what just happened. I had this moment where I was kind of like, people must know I'm like an occupier. Like, I just, this thing just happened to me, because I, I felt like I somehow was it, like I'm imbuing this like thing, and um, that was kind of this strange collapsing moment for me where I uh, was able to see what had been going on, you know, less than a mile away from us the whole time that we were at the park. And that was something that being so far down in the corner of Manhattan, I um, didn't see. And by not being able to go back to Brooklyn, I think in the back of my head, I did always know that the people that I knew and worked with before this movement that couldn't be at the park or couldn't be at every action were still doing the things that they were doing. And so that was kind of a really strange micro macro look for me because I, uh, at the same time that I knew that, <laughs> that no one above 14th Street cared that the park had been raided, I also knew that over 100,000 people were watching the streams at that very moment. So it's this kind of um, moment where you really understand that people are gonna do with their time what they feel is most important. And what I think that can say as far as social transformation on a larger scale is that there, there has been um, in, in many different ways, different kind of just awakening moments that people talk about. For certain people, obviously not for everyone, that's not a blanket statement that could be issued about what Occupy has brought to the conversation, but it can be brought uh, into the conversation as far as those people who were maybe half away or wanting to have something broader to look into. Um, I reflect really quickly now on global noise, if anyone took part in that, it was like on the 13th to 15th, and I knew a lot of people that organized that in other countries, and um, they're kind of reflecting on that kind of as a failure because there wasn't this giant outreach and they're kind of figuring out what that means. And I asked my friend who organized it in Spain why he thought it was a failure. There was actually still tons of people that came out. And they just said, you know, it didn't go quite the way they thought, they were just gonna keep going. And so as far as social transformation, I think people's willingness to continue going and not, like Dave said, not see the movement as being like open on like September 17th of last year and kind of closed at this point is a, a broader way of looking at it because there's no, 
I don't think it was as occupied as done per se, or that I know I and maybe we'll talk about this later. I've always seen occupy as a tactic, not a movement. Um, and when I talk about the movement, I don't know quite what I'm referring to, but I'm, I think that I'm talking about a broader global thing that's happening right now. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so back in like 2006 to 2007, um, before he was this kind of like big movement celebrity, David Graeber was writing for this magazine called Rolling Thunder, which was put up in Crank Think. I'm not sure if people are familiar with that. But he put up this really beautiful essay called The Shock of Victory, where he essentially, and this was kind of like during this big malaise in the anti-war movement where we weren't really sure how to go forward and like things were really falling apart. Um, and he, he kind of explained that lots of times, if, historically, direct action movements tend to accomplish their medium-term goals way faster than anyone, especially them, thought was possible. Um, but because they accomplish their medium-term goals so quickly, they don't know how to move forward to accomplish their long, like, long, long-term goals. And because of that, they're seen as a failure. And he gives all these different examples of it. Um, for instance, the ultra-globalization movement, a lot of people in, in the movement in the mid-90s and the late 90s, or like in like around 1999 thought that like their their goals of trying to like bring down the Washington consensus and like open up space for like different projects beyond neoliberalism would take a decade or two if were even achievable at all. And by the time that like that kind of cycle of struggles ended a couple years later, they they had actually accomplished much more than anyone had thought was possible in the span of just a couple years. And I, I think that that if you look historically at the like the the functions of direct action movements like that, that is something that like, seems to be true over and over again. For instance, during the anti-war movement, I was involved with a struggle in Olympia, Washington, to call poor militarization resistance, where we were trying to stop um, the use of our publicly owned port by the military to ship stuff to Iraq and Afghanistan. We thought this was gonna be like a five-year or like super long-term struggle, and within the course of a year, we had not only accomplished everything we thought was possible, like much, much more. But in all of these examples, because they accomplished these like things they thought weren't possible, they don't know how to move forward to accomplish these even longer term goals of like bringing down the state and capital. And I think with, with Occupy, um, if you think about what, what kind of the medium term goals for, for Occupy were, in a certain sense it was trying to transform the public discourse around the economy and around like kind of economic injustice and also proliferating these models of prefigurative politics and like different ways of being in the world. And I feel like if you ask anyone in the middle of 2011 if those would be possible, if, like I didn't think it was. Um, I thought it was so impossible that I didn't show up to Occupy Wall Street for a while and I, I was very much like poo-pooing it. Um, and I, I think we need to be honest with ourselves that like what I think a lot of people on the left thought was impossible, absolutely, was accomplished in the span of a couple months. And just because we haven't then moved on to like taking down capitalism in the state doesn't negate the really real things that were transformed. And just in like, I guess like really specific examples, like dur during the craziness of the fall and winter, like all of a sudden like my parents are posting articles by David Graeber on Facebook. And my aunt who works at this tech company in the middle of New Jersey, who like, I'm not sure they identifies as leftist at all, is every, Every week, someone from her company is making runs to downtown Manhattan to deliver supplies. And I feel like in all these small ways that people that didn't even show up to the park, their life was trans transformed by the broader way that the political discourse was transformed. And I think we're not really going to see the long-term effects of that for like several years down the line, but I, I, th I think a lot, a lot more has been accomplished than anyone really thought could have happened. Um. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, because I want to leave lots of time for q and I'm actually going to combine the last two questions. And I also have been noticing, I mean, very, very clearly, um, one of the things that keeps coming up um, is the possibility of, uh, I mean, the Anarchist Project for Prefigurative politi Politics and sort of pre experimenting with ways of living that are somehow outside capitalism. And so, but also, some of the other panelists have expressed some doubts about whether it's possible to really be outside capitalism. For instance, we have um, the reference to buying coffee in the morning at McDonald's and, and things like that. So um, in, in perhaps answering these two remaining questions, if you could 
I mean, if if you want to, if you have a have a stance on it, um, maybe also address whether or not you see impossible to be outside politics in some way or create some kind of pocket um, within a capitalist society that is not specifically capitalist. Um, I'll read the last two questions. How, if at all, has Occupy changed your political outlook? Has it modified the kinds of goals you hope to achieve through your activism? Has your approach toward organizing a mass movement in order to accomplish these goals shifted at all? And also, what new possibilities has Occupy opened up that beforehand seemed impossible? Conversely, is there anything once that you once felt had been politically possible at Occupy's off outset, but now no longer feel as possible? Um, open it up for your responses. Please go ahead and respond, Dave. Um, uh, well, before Occupy, I was reading Capital because it was the financial crisis, and I, you know, it seemed like there was nothing was happening, uh, and I was trying to understand capitalism. Uh, I feel like now, after Occupy, I'm more favorable to uh, anarchism in general than I was before Occupy. Um, I, I'm, I'm. You know, I know how to organize workers now. I've been trained by my working group in the IWW. Um, before Occupy, I kind of thought that one way we could uh, fight corporate capitalism would be to unionize Walmarts and maybe collectivize some of them uh, across the country. Um, now, I still think that would be a good road to fight it, but I also am more open to understanding that there's not going to be one way to do things and that you know things are going to develop um, and in the way that they're going to develop and a lot of different ideas and a lot of different heads and opinions are going to be necessary I do think that different people with different ideas with different opinions kind of rub together and talked in the park and I think that was one of the most powerful things about it you had someone who liked trust you had someone who liked insurrection you had someone who liked unions you know and they're all talking and I think that uh, one of the reasons that Occupy has slowed is because we don't have a way to do that. Um, so I guess my I've become more favorable to those things. Uh, so for me, that's one way of change. Also, now, now I'm, I'm, I'm writing something where uh, I'm comparing, this is a lead into the second part of it, I'm comparing the pre prefigurative anarchism to John Dewey's experimentalism. Um, and I, I feel like action and things happening go back into thought, and then thought goes back into action, and there are these back and forth between them. Just to kind of address what we've been talking about, I've actually been writing about this because Ross, who's in the audience, uh, interviewed David Gra Graber, I can never say his name, <laughs> uh, about these questions, and Graber said that, well, I don't believe that capitalism is a totality, because Ross brings up the fact that capitalism is a totality, and Graeber, this is something I'm writing actually right now, uh, Graeber disagrees, and he says that, no, it's not a totality, so it was okay, you know, they could bring water bottles in and french fries or whatever, because he thinks that's wrong, and so I kind of, in my writing, I'm going, I go back to Heraclitus and Paramedes, you know, she's, Paramedes sees the world as a whole, Heraclitus sees the world as constantly changing, and Hegel kind of takes a little bit of both of them. I know this is getting like really abstract. Um, and uh, both Marx and Bakunin have different opinions on this. You know, Marx is more into the workers, and Bakunin is into the workers too, but likes the peasants, you know, um, thinks the peasants are cool. Uh, so I kind of argue that it's kind of like quantum physics. It matters which way you look at capitalism. If you, you can look at parts of it where it looks like a totality, and then you can look at other parts of it where it looks like not a totality, and we interpret things through the metaphors that we're comfortable with. Um, so it matters if you've read a lot of anarchist stuff or if you've read a lot of Marxist stuff, which way you want to look at what capitalism is. And uh, I, I got that from, from reading the Platypus Review. It got my, my mind thinking, my, my mind working, but that's it. Um, you know, I think I really 
love camping. I think it's really important. I think that camping makes you, I think it makes you start to negotiate inside and outside environments in a really important way. And camping in the financial district is really weird and it's really fun. And, um, and to be able to do that, um, well, it made me, you know, the time I spent at Zuccotti Park, I was really angry all the time. I was really angry, but I wasn't necessarily like, more angry than I had before, I had been before. It just was a means to articulate that anger. Um, but, you know, after you, after you spent time at Occupy, the rest of the city started to look different. It started to look more foreign. And, and I think that's really important. I think that um, being an Occupy helped me articulate the political as a space um, with a lot of different forces at play. Um, it helped me look at, look at everything differently. Like I started noticing the advertisements on the subway in a certain way. I started noticing the police barricades. I started noticing all of these different forces at play um, in the city that are determining where you walk and where you don't walk, um, what you imagine is possible and what you're not allowed to imagine. Um, but it also, but it also uh, made me question the means by which we are trying to achieve this democracy. Um, at Zuccotti Park, I realized that the very few people there were um, were looking closely. Um, like nobody was questioning, like why does this park look like a prison? Or are just because we have the right to express ourselves, does that mean that we have the freedom to be heard? Or um, where? does this fight take place? Is it on the streets or is it somewhere else? Um, and is delegating power to the majority really a good idea in the long run? Um, but to, I guess to go back to talk about political possibility, I think if anything Occupy was a rupture, it was the result of pressure building up under a membrane and um, and it closed up very quickly, but that energy is still there, and there will be other ruptures in different forms. Um, I think we do have to take into account counter-revolution, a counter-revolution that has been going on for decades, where um, the role of the state becomes the management of a potential crisis. And I think that if Occupy or whatever it turns into is, is going to succeed or come close to anything that we could call success, then it's going to have to move very quickly. It's going to have to take different forms. Um, it's going to have to become aware of its environment in a way that it wasn't before. Uh, so uh, I approached Occupy Wall Street uh, extremely optimistically. Um, I had recently gotten back from Nepal, and I was kind of into Mao and Che and all this rural guerrilla warfare. And then actually seeing what the Maoists in Nepal had done, I became very disillusioned by that method of bringing about social change. Um, and I actually found out that they didn't overthrow the king. They had this weird thing called Jana Andalin II, or the People's Movement, where like the people just like took to the streets and took it over, and I was, had no conception of what that really meant. Um, and then Career Square happened, and it was just like, oh my god, I cannot believe that this is possible. Uh, so when I came to New York, I was really, really excited, because I think that tactically this is like the most pertinent question in today's society, how to create that type of movement and make it work. Um, at Occupy Wall Street, I found out that uh, doublespeak about democracy is not limited to our rulers who say that they're being democratic um, when actually they're not. Um, I found 
um, the overall mood amongst many people, particularly active in Occupy Wall Street, to be incredibly anti-democratic, very hostile to democracy, uh, very hostile to one person, one vote, majority rules. It was always in the interest of protecting minorities like women and black and brown people who are actually not minorities. Um, they're both majorities in the world. And I don't think that they need protection from uh, the white men who are generally ruling Occupy Wall Street movement. Um, political possibilities, though, I think that uh, it's going to happen again. Like, every single financial crisis that has ever happened in the history of this country has resulted in people doing massive demonstrations on Wall Street. Sometimes they take over the Brooklyn Bridge. This is not a new thing at all. Uh, there were Hoovervilles in Central Park after the Great Depression. They took over Central Park, which is pretty awesome. Um, so this is going to come back. Uh, I think what it did was it didn't make this thing possible. It clearly was possible already. But it did make it possible in the minds of this current generation. And I'm glad we got it out of the way. And we, you know, the next generation is going to have to do it again. Hopefully we can do it again. And I think that right now we need to start organizing in more democratic, participatory, non-oppressive ways so that when it does come back, because it is going to come back, we're actually going to have something better to put in place of what we are trying to get rid of. So first I'd kind of like to clarify that um, I think when discussing prefigured politics, uh, I'm not trying to indicate that I believe that there's it's possible to just create some space outside of capitalism. Um, but I also don't believe that capitalism is maybe a totality. I think more of what I'm trying to get at, um, so Ashanti Alston, this former Black Panther, when he talks about prefigured politics, he uses this kind of interesting Christian metaphor from the Bible, where the, the early Christians thought of themselves as in this world, but not of it. So kind of like one, one foot in, in the world as it is in the empire that they were in, and one fold one foot in this other world that was like kind of a becoming world. And I think that really is how we should think and orient ourselves um, in, in this struggle. Another way of looking at it is if you look at kind of like the only really successful revolutions that we we kind of like have reported in the recent past or in modernity is the ones that kind of like force this transition to capital or capitalism or bourgeois society in the nation state. And it, it I think if we look at them just as like the French Revolution or the American Revolution, we're missing really the processes that made them possible, which was this long process of building the institutions that laid the foundation for bourgeois society. So this long process of kind of building banks and city-states and parliaments and all these different things that were the seeds that eventually erupted into this new world. Um, and so I think the question is like, what, what does that look like? Like what are the seeds? that look like the world that we're trying to build and what can we do to kind of like sow those seeds now. Um, and then I, I think Occupy kind of forces, I don't know, so um, I, I think what we can learn from Occupy is that in a certain sense, our, all of our ideas about direct democracy and figurative politics are both right and wrong, if that makes sense. Um, so when when these different occupies shot up all over the country, people immediately took to self-organizing, and um, like people wouldn't just kind of like sit around. Like people took on projects and did work and found ways to share the work and different things. So I feel like a lot, a lot of what I guess in the anarchist movement people have been developing over these years and in small, small environments and small projects with this kind of like hope that like this would be the nucleus of someday a mass movement, actually in a certain way came true. Um, and it was really interesting to me because being in Olympia during the port protest, um, we at the time really sincerely believed that we were kind of this vanguard that like was gonna inspire this mass direct action movement all over the country, and that didn't happen. And part of it people kept telling us was that our ways of organizing were so culturally specific, we kept being told over and over again that you're never going to see a meeting of 100 people in the Midwest doing the twinkle fingers or trying to use consensus or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So to me, on the one hand, Occupy showed that like those of us kind of like 
groping in the dark for 10 years trying to keep this project of direct democracy alive weren't crazy. But I think on the other hand, it showed that everything we knew about direct democracy and periphery politics was also wrong in the sense that these methods that we developed on like through like trying to write info shops and trying to coordinate direct action campaigns actually weren't expandable and in many ways fell apart when we tried to apply them to this huge mass movement and how to run a camp and stuff like that. Um, in this essay in the book We Are Many that Cindy Milstein wrote, I, I think she kind of sums up the predicament by saying that Occupy presented us with the humble experience of coming face to face with the chicken and egg question, the vegan version of course. <laughs> society and selves need to change before ourselves and society can change, yet we can only transform society and ourselves through the very process of trying to do so. Um, and so I think in a certain way it just shows that like the process of changing society and building this new world is a lot messier than a lot of us thought when the project was a lot smaller than it was before 2011. Um, and one more thing I want to put out there that I think we need to think through in light of Occupy is I think in, in building movements, there's two different ways of relating to time. Um, there's kind of like these moments that are like what I would call cycles of struggle, like parts of 2011, but before that 2009 with the student uprising, or before that like 1999 to 2001, where it seems like everything you do is these huge reverberations and like you're making history right now and like, like it's the moment. And then there's all of the rest of the time that we're alive, which hopefully is the slow grassroots capacity building work of actually building our capacity and building a movement. And I think what tends to happen is whenever we're in something that feels like it's the moment, like you know the fall of 2011, we drop all of the longer term work we were doing. And then when it no longer feels like it's the moment, we don't know how to return to this longer term grassroots like movement building work. And we get depressed and we like get nostalgic, and we keep trying to do things that we think is going to reinvigorate Zuccotti Park or bring back Occupy or whatever. And if you look at history, that something very similar happened at the end of the 60s, and something very similar happened after 2001, and in smaller scales and projects that I've been involved with. So I think trying to think through how we relate our longer term capacity building, like movement building work, with these moments where it feels like we're making history right now and like the whole world is watching us, I think is really key to figure out how do we go from here. Because I think Sure, another eruption um, like Zuccotti Park is going to happen, but it's important to see what capacity we can build between then and now so it turns out differently. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, you'd like to, yeah. Victoria. I'll try and be short because I think that I'm sure we'll cover a lot, of, um, a lot more of these things in the question and answer se segment. Um, I'm really glad you spoke about like the moment. That was kind of like what I was thinking but didn't know how to say, um, and also about the short, middle, and long-term goals. Um, when I think about how Occupy and all of its offshoots have changed my political outlook, I'm, I, again, I'm, I'm 22, um, recently 22, so I'm pretty young, uh, and I think I've always thought of myself as radical, just in terms of my personal politics and as much of what I could kind of get my hands on um, as a youth and as a young adult. Um, and I, um, my father lost his job like four years ago, and that was like, being from an already kind of lower middle class family, that was like a really big thing for my family. Um, and then getting into school, it was a full tuition like school, but still having student loans and kind of being on my own. I, um, I kind of feel like I experienced this um, kind of washing over of the city onto how I viewed myself and I kind of had built this routine for myself where I was just kind of fending for myself making sure I had work, making sure I was doing school, making sure I was supporting my family. And in a lot of that, my the things that I viewed that made up my the radical components of myself kind of got put on the back burner because of this idea of the moment. And I um, I was fortunate enough to have um, some professors that were, were a really big part of ACT UP and were able to work art into their um, to their like political work and their art work. And I remember thinking and like kind of being like, well, if only I had like a large social movement that I could ground my work in, I guess I'll just wait. <laughs> and it was like this crazy moment where I was like, I, I guess I'm content waiting. Um, and so this really for me was that kind of cliche waking up moment where I was like, wait a second, I don't want to be a part of this art world. I hate the art world. I don't like white box galleries. I'm in this school because I like art, not because I want to be an artist with a capital A. Um, 
And so it really, it really was that kind of mirror moment where I was like, wait a second. And I've been able to since kind of regather a lot of um, composure for myself and ground myself in that. So that's, I guess, my political outlook. Um, as an activist, and mass movements are concerned. I don't know if any of you have read the zine Anti-Mass. It's on. Um, it's it's easily available if you look it up. But I, to this day, I'm not sure if I believe in mass movements, rather like mass mobilizations of lots of people that can get together that are made up of small movements that are like in agreement with each other. Because it's just like that's something that's always made sense to me. And I think even in Zuccotti, which was not the biggest of all encampments anyone's ever seen, um, that was really evident. There was like this kind of small group, and then there were the bigger groups and the bigger groups and the bigger groups, but there was really nothing that held those things together in a stable or long-term way. And I think I was able, in those moments, to like both be aware of the kind of um, chaos and humming of those large groups and how they were just happening, and also the fact that they were not happening because maybe we intended them to happen, just that they were happening. Um, and so there's a lot of, um, for me, I've been able to reflect back on a lot of intention and what we thought was going to happen based on like, the, like the less than 20 people that were meeting in August to the 200 people that were in the park to the like 20,000 people that were um, out on big days or you know the more that were out around the country. Um, I do remember, um, as far as political possibilities, I do remember um, feeling some real. Um, kind of almost guilt for putting forth this model of like this camping in public space, which like for, for me felt so meaningful because we were doing it in this space, which wasn't Wall Street, but was as close as we could get. And then all of these other cities adopting this model and taking it to parks because they felt like they had to be in parks, even though maybe they were already socially um, working together in spaces that weren't parks and then getting squashed by like the state. Um, we had different hotlines and like emails and people could email us and ask us about these questions and, and all across the board and just like really like to this day I still feel like extremely guilty about people would call and be like we're having this problem someone's stolen all the money we're having this problem there's like gangs with guns coming into the occupation we're having this problem people are being sexually assaulted and they felt really alone because they couldn't tell oh. hi I just I just want to I'm okay. sorry to cut That's you right. off but I actually would really like to open sure. it up for questions because right. That's okay. yeah. um, as some of you might realize we have food uh, we have dumplings in the meat and vegan variety so maybe you can <laughs> if anyone wants to go get food it's out there so we would take like a five minute break for the Q&A um, okay. so we like after we like open up the discussion we'll have a microphone that will go around and again um, so we have food out there, we have publications, we're the Platypus Affiliate Society. If you're interested or like to find out more, we have a sign-up sheet as well, for instance, about the upcoming event, which Ross mentioned. And yeah, so maybe five minutes and then back back here for the Q&A, because we do have limited time. Okay, back here at 8.25, uh, please. Okay. Hey Brian, is there a way to pause this or can you only stop it? Does it matter? I don't think it really matters, but... First of all, each of the panelists to introduce themselves so that we all know who they are. Here we go. Hey, I'm uh, Fritz Tucker. 
a student at the CUNY Grad Center, um, kind of studying urban revolutions, believe it or not, uh, from Occupy Wall Street to Nepal, where I spent some time. And uh, you can read my articles about Occupy Wall Street. If you Google Fritz Tucker, Occupy Wall Street will probably pop up. I'm Victoria Campbell. I'm an artist. Um, nothing happens when you Google my name. Uh, I'm, I'm David Hawk. Things happen when you Google my name. Um, um, I guess in the in the thing that they put online, it says I'm part of Occupy Your Workplace, which is a working group of Occupy Wall Street. We try and organize unorganized workers. We're putting together a pamphlet like the strike debt one right now, uh, or, which is a really great pamphlet. Um, and uh, yeah, I've written for Platypus and, and other stuff. And, yep. Okay. Oh, good idea. Um, my name is Victoria Sobel. I am uh, 22, and I'm also an artist. I'm uh, currently a student at Cooper Union, so just like down the street. And I'm originally from Maryland, um, kind of in between DC and Baltimore. Um, I'm currently still involved with Global Revolution. It's a media collective. It's a global media collective, um, and not so many working groups, but. Um, if you live in Brooklyn and you're part of any sort of collective, talk to me afterwards. We're kind of making an assembly of collective groups that are um, not just not in Brooklyn. If you're not from Brooklyn, we'll talk to you. If you're in any sort of collective. Hi, my name's Sean Kana. I'm an organizer with Strike Debt and a bike messenger. Um, and over the past 10 years, I had previously been really involved with the kind of direct action wings of the anti-war and student movement. Okay, uh, thanks so much. And now we're gonna take some questions from the audience. There's, um, there's a microphone here. Um, okay, I think you're, well, okay. Great. Um, hi guys. So um, I was kind of wondering if we could maybe hear a little bit more on your thoughts, kind of going off of the idea of Occupy as a people's movement. Um, I wonder if you all would consider it a people's movement, and if so, um, I'm wondering to what extent we can think of um, a people, like can we think of an American people, or um, you know, who might be the people then instigating this uh, movement or tactic, however you are considering it. And then furthermore, um, I'm wondering if you, what you think about the idea of Occupy as a populist movement, whether that would be useful or um, <coughs> harmful or beneficial, and in what ways, um, I guess, kind of just considering those things. Who would, yeah, who would like to answer that? Just uh, indicate if you'd like to, go ahead. Um, It's funny, I, I was just talking about that with my boyfriend earlier today, um, and as much as I would want to, call it a people's movement, I think, and something that was slightly uh, covered while we were doing the, the Q&A was that um, as much as I might want to call Occupy a people's movement, there were a large number of peoples that were absent from the movement that could not be a part of the movement for <coughs> all sorts of reasons, and that really the movement was, or the movement as it stands, is made up of people who are able to be a part of the movement or who can come to the table. Um, and if you have to put a name to those people, it's maybe people who can afford to be off work or can afford to take off of school or you know don't can risk arrest in certain things and um, so in that way you know it does go back to sort of different class and sort of standings I wouldn't call it like a populist movement I, I, I do think it should and I hope would strive to continue towards the idea of a people's movement and how to really reach I'm not sure what that would mean but how to really reach beyond what it's done so far um, so, in my studies of people's movements uh, around the world, I would definitely say that it was pretty typical people's movement. Um, and it really helped me understand what a people's movement was. Um, it's different from an organization. A movement is when many, many organizations come together uh, for a common goal. I would say the common goal was combating the financial bourgeoisie and they're throwing us all into crisis. 
Um, I had something else to say, but I forgot. Sorry. I want to say I'm skeptical of the idea of the people or a people's movement. I, I think that historically there's been this kind of like messy, intertangled web thing of the people and the nation state and modernity and this idea of like the majority. And I, I feel like kind of in, in thinking what our left in the 2012 should look like, I, I think maybe, maybe talking about the people isn't the best way to move forward. Um, I'm equally skeptical of that term, and um, throughout the movement, I was, um, yeah, I was interested in in the premise of there being a 99%, um, how broad that was, and whether or not um, a people or even a class could be defined by just um, one's financial position. Like, I mean, especially in New York, where nobody's poor, but everybody's broke. Um, there's what, but I, but what I do think it was was a bunch of people who were, um, who were, you know, in, in a very, in a really specific demographic, like mostly white, mostly middle class, or mostly identified as middle class, and mostly young, and staring the future down the barrel and not really liking what it looked like. Um, but I think it was an attempt to really find. Um, to find comrades and to find people who were in the same place as as you were, in the hopes that that, in, in the hopes that some kind of intensity could be built from that. Okay. Um, I guess like I s those are two separate questions. Like the the part that it's about a people's movement and the part if uh, it's a populist movement. Um, I actually think I differ in the way that I do like populist discourse. I think it has its limits. Obviously, you know, um, I do know people who feel alienated from it because of those limits. You know, they feel like there's cisgender privilege and racial privilege and gender privilege in it. Um, and, but what I think is great about Occupy is that it, it was able to take populist rhetoric while not losing those critiques within it, even though obviously there, I'm sure people had experiences where they felt like those critiques were lost within it. Um, I, I also think that it obviously it was a certain demographic of the population who could come into the park, but I think that what made Occupy so successful is that that populist rhetoric was so appealing to people everywhere. Um, and so, and I also think that there was a nice coming together of kind of anarchist, small scale collectivist ideas with, with this like left populism. And I think they sort of complemented each other really well during the days of the park at least, you know? And they were able, I, I think there was like different critiques coming together within it. Um, so I actually like the populist discourse as a metaphor of people coming together at least. As far as a people's movement, then we have to define like what a people is, <laughs> which is sort of like a 17th, 16th, or 17th century like concept, right? Of uh, this is what a people's is, right? So we got to decide: can we be a humanity as such, or are we just, you know, um, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I do, I do like. I know there's like severe criticisms of the populist rhetoric. But I think that so far it's done more good than it's done harm. Do okay. you want to add? Yeah, sorry. Um, I so I just want to say that I think that uh, the anarchists really set the stage. The people who started it set the stage, and uh, they started this occupation. But it really only became a mass movement when uh, large segments of our society started showing up um, around the third weekend. Uh, you had tens of thousands of people, there are unions, all sorts of progressives. And um, I think this kind of movement, where it's very, very pluralistic, shows us where we are at as a society, all the different threads of political discourse that we have to deal with, and how hard it is to go from where we are at right now uh, to the next step together. Because I do think that uh, a 
above all else, we do need to move on together. So I think the movement really brings all that to the forefront. <coughs> Oh, no, actually, the front row. Yeah. Um, all right, so my question is hopefully a fun one. Um, I ask myself it all the time. If you could go to the fir back to the first, like, say, within the first three weeks and give yourself a message or try to change one thing in the part, what would it be? Would someone like to start with that? Victoria Sobel, do you want to? Are you, are you raising your oh, hand? I wasn't, but you I, were not. I, I you can, can do it. I can do it. Um, I think, I, like you, I came into the park with a, a really, really heavy skepticism. I was so negative about um, Occupy coming into it the, the weeks prior to it. I like rode by. Tompkins Square on my bike, and I was like looking at like the group meeting. I was like, <laughs> it was it was bad. Um, but I, um, what I saw in the first week. Um, all right, here's here it is, Kevin. Here it is. I would have told the person who had started the WePay in his name not to do that. Um, and that's how finance and and taking in online crowdsourcing became this massive question and responsibility and that was something that I worked with very personally in the first month and it was something that like was not on people's minds and then was the only thing people could talk about. Um, so I would have told him the day I met him in the kitchen to close that and that we could just keep going straight food. Okay, uh, someone else? I guess if I like, I guess if I can go back, I would try and like. I mean, I would tell myself to stop taking things so seriously and maybe attempt to start a coup or at least uh, like a radical extremist counter revolution mm -hmm. that just played freeze tag in the streets. That was <laughs> I, I would have shown up. Um, it, it took me almost a month of like Occupy happening before I was even sure if I identified with it or not. And part of that is just like the the years before Occupy, like being on the radical left was very very depressing. Um, just kind of seeing like all of the projects that we had like tried really hard to build had fallen apart. And there was a time, especially in New York, and then also where I was mostly in the Northwest, where like a lot of radicals were like. Like people hated each other so much, there was all these divisions that it was really like it was really hard to still want to be part of the movement. And especially when, when Occupy was starting, I, I was kind of like it. It seemed to me almost like naive that in in Egypt there was this decade of building um, building capacity for Tahrir Square with um, the the different networks that made that possible. And it, it seemed like we were kind of just like trying to replicate this tactic without looking at the context that that happened in. Um, and so I, I guess, I guess if I could have gone back, I would have told myself to not be so cynical. And I feel I felt really jealous during the, the first like six months of Occupy of all these people that hit, this was their first foray into the radical left because they're so optimistic and so excited about everything. And I felt like I, even to this day, I'm still kind of like. The person's like, calm down, you guys. It's gonna get really bad. Like, <laughs> um, just because before Occupy, being on the left was like a really trying and depressing thing, and um, it, it going through that over and over again, it gets really hard to get your hopes up. Okay, um, Fritz. Um, so I would say that uh, by far the number one issue uh, that. I felt became more and more important every single day uh, was having a democratic system in which the majority ruled. I think that the number one impediment for getting things done and getting the right things done was the uh, consensus method uh, or the modified consensus of having 90% of people have to agree on something. It's really not hard math, but if 90% of people have to agree on something to get done. That means 
11% of people can stop things from getting done. And that is dictatorship of the minority, if you ask me. Um, democracy is the logical end to dialogue. Not everyone gets their way all the time, but things get done. It gets done together, which is very important. And I would say that I trust people. Most of the time, the right thing gets done. Uh, my workplace organized and uh, while this was all happening, and I was very adamant that we do a majority rules thing, uh, we ended up doing that. Uh, the only three things we actually voted on, um, I was very adamant about my positions. Um, I lost, my position lost all three of the votes, uh, but I respected the democratic process, went along with it, and I later agreed that it was actually the right thing to do. Um, I was not in the right, the majority was in the right. Okay. Uh, does anyone else have some have anything to say about this question, or should we take, I think we we're ready for another question. Um, and yeah. so, uh, I would just like to ask um, how destructive the movement overall. I mean, you've made it clear what your stance on that is. Um, the horizontal organization of it all, and um, <coughs> the generals. How, how destructive would you say that was to the movement overall? Um, how destructive was it? I mean, it would be really hard to measure that. I think that there are, <laughs> um, you know, I think that there's, you know, there are many pitfalls in having a democratic system based on the majority um, or dominated by the majority because it doesn't necessarily mean that the majority is going to get to decide or that the majority has power. What that means is that the individuals or ideologies or um, whatever force that can communicate to the majority the best is the one in power. Um, when it comes down to it, I don't think that the system that Occupy Wall Street had in place really allowed for um, any kind of uh, effective critical discourse. Um, I don't think it allowed, like what it did basically was that it there was a general fear of all kinds of hierarchy, even um, even experience, and so that meant that that meant that there weren't like experts dominating, but that also meant that one's individual experience and knowledge um, wasn't considered unless it was shared by everybody else. So that puts the majority at um, kind of like a lowest common denominator when it comes to addressing problems. Um, and uh, the systems of communication, I think, also contributed to this kind of breaking apart. Like, when it comes down to it, like, the human microphone can be a powerful thing. It was very effective in the first few days. But it doesn't allow for a more, it, you're like, basically, you're speaking in, like, Twitter language. Like, you can't, like, you can't say very much. Um, you can't discuss it. The General Assembly allowed a lot of space for deliberation, but it didn't allow space for arguments. And I think that um, that, that arguments um, could have been, would probably have been very productive. Um, the General Assembly's got so long that people got bored. They didn't care about their positions so much. And so um, I think that, yeah, I, I think that the dictatorship of the majority did contribute to this destruction. I don't know how fast or at what point it did, um, or how you could be, yeah, like me, I think the ways in which it did are, are very specific and not inherent to this process, but certainly come along with it. Um, 
David, did you? Yeah. Um, actually, I wrote something called The Future Belongs to the Process Fetishist um, that was never published. Um, and it was kind of about, you know, I believe that democracy doesn't connotate one thing, it doesn't connotate majoritarian. Uh, democracy, you know, uh, democracy to me is an experimental process where we try and find a system that has the greatest amount of representation to the greatest amount of people. Um, so in that way, like, the horizontal process to me is a form of democracy, if not majoritarian democracy, and then we can get into a discussion about anarchism, but I'm not going to right now. Um, so I think actually the horizontal process worked then it worked in the way that it didn't work exactly the way that it was supposed to work. <laughs> and I'll explain this. Um, I think that if it was like a direct method of voting where it stuff could run through and you could get results really quickly, then like we would have the chance of ending up with like the Ron Paul amendment to something, you know? I thought for the situation, the fact that it was like a slow process that took a long time, it took work. It was called consensus building because you built it up um, was a good thing. And I, I was sort of surprised when the first communication of uh, Wall Street came out, the one that was like read on the air that I agreed with it so much. Um, I forget what, but uh, um, what that was called exactly. But uh, so I think that in a way the, the horizontal process worked for the movement. It did kind of bring out sort of a, uh, <coughs> A, uh, there's a, an element within democracy which is mer meritocratic, you know, which is you have to show up, right? That's what democracy is, you have to show up somewhere. So since the horizontal process kind of heightened that and people who showed up more, um, you know, had more of a say in it. Uh, so, I mean, I think there are serious problems with it. For certain situations, I think it would be awful. Um, for certain situations, there'd be other forms of democracy that would be better, um, or other processes that would be better. Um, I think when May 1st planning was coming, uh, the Spokes Council and the General Assembly were completely dissolved um, during that time. And I think it would have been great to see like some kind of new process come out that was going forward. And people tried to plan that in the summer, and nothing came. And then we had the second, September 17th, which brought the movement back. So I think it doesn't really matter what kind of process it is exactly, as long as it's bringing different people together with different ideas. Like I thought what was great about May 1st was anti-authoritarian and anarchist and labor union people coming together. David, I'm, I'm, thanks. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand the microphone to Fritz here because we have a, another question over here and I have a quick question. There's some in the back as well. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll try to be real quick. Uh, everything I'm saying is in much more detail in my articles, but to be very, very specific of how destructive uh, process was. Um, so on day two, during the first uh, General Assembly in Zuccotti Park, uh, one of the main things became whether or not we should march on Wall Street. Uh, this was at a time when people did not know how hostile or how not hostile the cops were to us. Um, the leaders were like, we must have unity above all else, and leading us in these chants with the human microphone. Um, when it became clear that their position that we should not uh, march on Wall Street became the dominant position, um, they had a vote, they lost the vote, but right before they were going to lose the vote, they were like, just so everybody knows, we are all autonomous individuals and we can do whatever we want. So, so much for unity. Um, on the other hand, when the General Assembly became totally bureaucratized and just was totally falling apart, they came up with the Spokes Council, uh, who was less participatory and less democratic. Um, in order to push through the idea of the Spokes Council, which was not popular, it lost four votes before it finally got pushed through. Um, during the final vote, they led chants and songs about how much unity we needed, even though the plan that they were doing was to break down the unity into the Spokes Council, which was not unified. So instead of amending the General Assembly so that it did promote unity, uh, they got rid of it while saying this is the most democratic thing we could possibly think of. Thank you. I wanted to, you have a question. Yeah. Oh. Right. Wait, wait for the microphone. <laughs> um. So what do you all think is 
one of the next big points of struggle for the left. Um, how has Occupy possibly laid the groundwork for that struggle, and in what ways has it not laid the groundwork and might we have to reinvent things? Um, Sean, did you, you were looking at me, do you want to say something about that? Um, yeah, um, I, I think that right now, um, so early in the panel, people talked a couple times about there being the inevitability of another kind of big rupture, like, Zuccotti Park, and I think one thing that seems looming is that um, the student debt crisis, it, it seems pretty apparent to me, in the next couple years is going to cause some type of much deepening of the crisis that we're in right now, um, because the bubble is over a trillion dollars, and I think it's inevitable that it's, it's going to collapse. Um, and so I, I think doing some work now to prepare structures um, that are expandable in the ways that maybe some of the structures weren't, that can contain what potentially could be a very large um, and potentially very powerful anti-capitalist movement. I, I think it's some important work to happen now that is beginning to happen through strike debt. And I, I think part of that, what that looks like is, I, I feel like in the past, um, so I, I feel like part of it is figuring out what organizing around debt looks like and like how, how do we create the debtor as like a political subject. And we're starting to do that through organizing like debt assemblies where people come together and talk about how debt's been affecting them. And I think through that we're kind of developing this analysis of debt and like what it means to act collectively against debt. Um, so I, I think that's one avenue kind of coming out of Occupy Wall Street. But I think there's also a whole many avenues. Okay. Uh, so anybody else have that have a response to that that particular question? Um, I'm not sure if, if Occupy Wall Street offered any real progress in terms of the left in a way that was different from movements before, before it. Um, it might have offered some insight as to what it means for the left in the present moment. But I think that as it goes on, then um, hopefully, hopefully these these kinds of movements can become more critical of democratic structures and question the democracy that is handed down to us. Um, and I think a lot of progress will happen on the left when these, when the institutions of the left have been dismantled. Um, so, okay, thank you very much. Um, I, have a, I have a quick question. I know there's also someone in the back. Um, this is, okay. I, I'll just say this quickly. I want to. Um, this is partly just following up on something um, that was touched on in a number of comments um, by Sham and some others. I'm, I'm particularly thinking about when Sham cited Shanti saying that we need to be in this world but not of it. And there was that in some ways capitalism was a totality and in some ways it was not. I'm, I'm wondering if capitalism is not, in some sense, a totality, why did, or, or if, I mean, how is it, how would it be not a totality if, in fact, the financial collapse, especially the collapse of Bear Stearns, affected every corner of the world? I mean, in what sense, what, what is, in what sense is it not a totality? That's, that's really the question, okay? I mean, is it, you know, I mean, for you, but also for the other panelists. Does anyone else want to answer first? Okay, um, okay so um, I feel like, so that's a complicated question, but I feel like in certain ways, on the one hand, there's all of this type of reproductive labor that has and hasn't been recuperated by capital. And I think another way, a useful way of looking at it is in David's, David Graeber's book about debt, he he talks about this idea of what he calls baseline communism, which is these kind of um, kind of like these very basic ways in which people cooperate and share that makes any type of sociality possible, um, and kind of argues that that creates the basis out of which like capital is possible. So that even even within this kind of totalizing system, there has to be some things that aren't based on exploitation and domination for the exploitation and domination to happen. Um, 
another way of looking at it is that in in Commonwealth, Gwena Hart and Negri's more recent books, they talk about this this idea that increasingly capital capitalist production is based on this idea of the common. That there's there's certain things that are, are held in common. That on the one hand, the types of new informationalized production that happens needs so things like computer codes, right? Like for for certain types of production to happen, everyone needs to have access to these kinds of languages and codes. But on the other hand, for it to be profitable, they need to kind of minimize access to that. So I feel like in a certain way, this kind of like baseline communism or this idea of the common is one of the major kind of contradictions within capital that like capital needs something beyond capital for it to survive, but also for it to expand, it needs to also destroy the thing that it needs. Would anybody else like to, like, um, to answer that question? I think capitalism is just a generalized social relationship and that if we can have, if we can somehow come to a point where we have a different social organization, um, then capitalism, then that relationship will be different. Um, I think that these, that a change in these relationships could happen. It's, I think that there's the greatest possibility at not necessarily at the level of the local, but at the level of the intimate. Um, but that would be a very grand restructuring of our understanding of our relationship to society. Um, well, I agree with Marx that it is a totalizing system, um, whereas you know all previous modes of production get drawn into capitalism. It's part of its nature of how it developed. Um, it's even Marx has a concept, he calls it a partial totality, I think. Um, I, you know, I think in the rich West, you can successfully completely drop out of capitalism if you want to. Um, I'm not, you know, saying that's a good or bad form of struggle. It's just possible. Um, and there are still some corners that capitalism hasn't touched. Um, and there, it's a, it's a way of, I think, as a way of looking at it, as a way of social, political, economic struggle, perhaps not economic, <laughs> but there's, there, there, it can be helpful to look at it not as a totality. Um, so I think in the ways that it's not a totality, there, I, 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 do, I don't know if I completely agree that it's parasitic upon other social relations, which is kind of what David Raber thinks. Um, but I mean, there are other ways to to uh, avoid its influence, I guess. Um, I know. Okay, I think Pam, were you? Were you? I think you were asked. You were raising a hand from the back row over there before. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Microphone, Pam. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that. One thing that happens in these conversations about Occupy is that all of a sudden there's a concentration on democracy. Like mm -hmm. we we go down the route in which we talk about like processes of exchange and communication and networks and committees and spoke councils, and they all seem to reflect an attempt at least to have an idea about what democracy could look like. So in a sense, like the answer to one of the questions is that the form of anti-capitalism that Occupy ha had was a stance that capitalism was somehow inherently anti-democratic and thus the movement should create opportunities for the articulation of democracy, whatever that could mean. And thus the, there was experimentation, there was failure, there were different attempts, but nonetheless, I think at the heart of the main comments that were said here, there was this sort of imagination that democracy could be created in these spaces, in these new social relations. So I guess that goes back to something that was you know, recently said, I mean, um, someone brought in Graeber, and which is the relationship between capitalism and democracy. Like, and how we conceive of like, either A, like historically, it's sort of coming into being. Did democracy actually require capitalism in order to open up spaces of civil society? And what's the relationship of it today? I, I, I think that, I wonder, I guess, in a kind of second remove, why those questions 
were not really at the forefront of the conversations that were happening in Occupy, even though they seemed so central. Meaning, like, I don't know if I have like a, an answer right now. I think it's an interesting conversation to you know have a discussion about what kind of politics respond to the contradictory character of democracy within capitalism. But it is perhaps sort of surprising or maybe revelatory of a problem that within a movement which this seems so central, those types of conversations were not happening. I think that the closest part of it, um, I remember, well, the, there was all this discussion about the gift economy that happened during uh, the May 1st. Um, I, I remember the planning meetings and these kind of things. But it, it just seems such a central issue that there should have been arguments, right? Discussions back and forth, sort of arguments presented as to what one thinks. But there weren't really any. So I just wonder why it was missing. Um, one thing that I learned at Sakati is that a festival is not the best place to talk about democracy. Um, I think that Occupy Wall Street, it became a spectacle. I think that the people who were leading it from the beginning wanted it to be a spectacle because they wanted to get on television. It became one, and then you had tourists showing up to see what was going on. They weren't interested in partaking in a democratic process. They just wanted to watch. They just wanted to be the viewers of the spectacle. So I think that is one reason why, as uh, a dominant uh, part of the discourse, it never happened. I will say, though, that I made it a point, I would go down there on Saturdays because I worked during the week. I made it a point of just going up to people and talking to them about the democratic process and where they would like to see it go. Whenever I said anything at the General Assembly, I always pushed that point. Um, however, after about a month, it became impossible to even speak at general assemblies. You had to go to like three different meetings first and then get put on the agenda. Um, so the democratic nature of it uh, quickly got suppressed. Um, and I think that it's times like these where we are more apt to talk about democracy. I think in our everyday lives, we have to talk more about democracy. The festival atmosphere was not particularly conducive. Um, I think I'm going to have to disagree with you in that it was a festival atmosphere. I mean, it was certainly a spectacle atmosphere, but um, the park and, and the movement from the very beginning was organized around around labor, around the same systems of production as in like an office environment, albeit a very a very horizontal one, but still. Like, you know, you have working groups. Um, affinity groups weren't given a lot of power. Um, and it also found its form through, um, through solutions. So that meant that long-term things, like, like having these conversations, weren't as important as um, breaking it up, breaking, um, breaking the goals of the movement into small tasks. And there also wasn't, there were also time and space limitations. There literally wasn't a space for these conversations to be had. And they were being had, but there wasn't a space for them to enter, um, to enter into the decision making. There, there just wasn't that structure. Um, <clears throat> I kind of want to echo what you said in the, um, my memories of the month of September where the, actually that conversation was very present, but that um, there weren't as many people and that that conversation didn't play into the structure that was being used for that smaller number. And then once once the park kind of exploded, that structure was held and, and then those conversations were pushed to the background and really what stayed um, in the forefront were the kind of infrastructural, how to keep moving, how to keep going and anything that was kind of more long term or conceptual was kind of relegated to like, have your conversation, you're a working group, but you probably won't be heard. Um, from what I do know about the domestic um, occupies and also the other global movements is that actually in 
their encampments and their um, movements, it actually is a much uh, bigger part of the conversation. Um, many of them did model their encampments and parks after us, but I think that what they were bringing to the table was something like really, really different. Um, I didn't get to go to too many, but I was in touch with a lot of people, and they were coming up with like actually a lot of really great alternatives that were possible in their communities, which were smaller or different than ours, which was not a pre-existing community, but rather like a, a kind of weird convergence of a bunch of people that didn't know each other. So Occupy, as it took place in smaller communities and cities and states, was actually really different because these were people who lived with each other. And aside from like Oakland and some of the other big ones, the Occupies were made up of people that already knew each other and were gonna keep living with each other. Um, so the conversation was really different for them. I'm gonna um, pause. I think um, it was interesting when we were talking, when the question was, is this a people's movement, uh, was posed. The question, or the question was really on the people, you know, is this a people's movement? The, the second aspect of that, you know, really was kind of taken for granted. I think, especially today, and especially in, in the absence of any sort of clear unified goal, um, one has to ask the question of what a, a movement, a social movement is. Because I mean, historically, uh, the idea of a movement really only emerged in the 19th century. Uh, theoreticians like Lawrence von Stein wrote about uh, the social movement in France. I mean, but the, the, the concept was that there was a sort of definite goal towards which a large mass of people, a large group of people, uh, were moving. It was that goal, in fact, that allowed them to uh, gauge um, how far they had come in relation to it. That was how they measured you know, where the movement had come, where it had been, and where it was going. And even after uh, the defeat of, of movements that wanted to abolish um, capital, that wanted to end uh, wage labor, um, there were still movements like uh, women's suffrage, uh, civil rights, and so on, each of which had you know, definitive goals like um, you know, achieving uh, a, a universal uh, male and female suffrage, uh, ending Jim Crow, etc. I wonder, you know, in the absence of any sort of clear, defined uh, goal, whether one can even measure movement, um, or even, you know, if if there is movement, if if it's unsure where it's going, you know, how how is it even certain, you know, whether it's moving backwards, forwards, etc. How does how does it even orient itself? And I guess with, in addition, you know, with, if one agrees that there is no sort of unified goal, what, what do you think that, you know, a sort of overarching goal should be? Um, I guess that could reflect your just sort of personal interests and just your opinions even. Who wants to take a first stab at that question? Um, so, I think the, the whole debate around whether or not there should be demands, um, I thought was kind of irrelevant, because I don't think listening to what people say is always the best way to figure out what they're doing. Um, people at Occupy Wall Street said a lot of stuff, but the... Uh, truth is, is that people were there because of the financial crisis. Every single financial crisis in the history of this country has resulted in a movement like this. Um, so people were there, and they were there for a reason. And once they got there, they all had a bunch of other secondary reasons that they wanted to put forward. Um, the same way in Tahrir Square, I know somebody who was there for the entire revolution, he said that He's a journalist, and he just went every single day and asked people what they're doing, the hippies, the liberals, the Muslims, and everybody wanted Mubarak out, and it was very clear that that's what everybody wanted. And then he was like, hey, what do we do after this? And then everyone was like, oh, we need to set up our 
Muslim utopia or our liberal utopia or our hippie utopia. Um, but there was a very clear movement. And I think Occupy Wall Street's movement is very clear. Could I just ask a point of clarification? Because earlier you were saying, you did mention something, Fritz, Fritz about um, taking stuff over, which sounds to me a lot like, I mean, it seems like a useful distinction here would be between occupation versus actually seizing power in some way. Because all usually when I think of the words taking, I mean, taking over, right, it really means in more kind of traditional left a sense it would mean seizing the state, which I don't think is what you're... Well, I, I would also say that... Utopia is, is not necessarily about that. Right. I mean, I, I don't think we should seize the state power so that we can use the state power ourselves. I think we need to have an alternate way of doing things. Um, but also, the, this movement to where the urban masses get together, uh, it's not something that started in the 18th or 19th or 17th century. Uh, when I was doing research about Nepal, uh, they had stuff going back to the 1500s. Um, I was just reading some Plutarch for class, and uh, during the Peloponnesian War, uh, the Spartan army was doing all this ridiculous amount of destruction um, to the Athenian army. But what made Pericles fall was uh, he had to have all of the Athenian citizens go inside the city walls, which point, uh, they all became very sick, and they had a movement, and they got rid of Pericles. So this is a very long tradition, and I'm glad to be a part of it. Um, I was reading a journal article recently, and there was a quote in it, and